Well, we started this uh, series on spiritual warfare a few weeks ago, and this was not a series that we were planning on doing. We inserted these three weeks after Easter because so many in our congregation have been battling in one form or another a very real spiritual warfare, and we felt strongly that the church, the body, needs to be equipped to deal with it. Not if it's going to happen, but when it comes to your doorstep, are you prepared to deal with spiritual warfare? I really encourage you to go back and watch the last two weeks. We started this series talking about how do we get ourselves generally prepared for when spiritual warfare happens, or have we done the, the work and walked with Jesus that our hearts, our minds, our spirits are already prepared for what we need to do. Last week, Pastor Greg talked about the people or the spirits, the forces that are engaged in this battle. We need to know who these forces are and what we're up against. But today we're gonna talk about the practicals of how do I actually, when it shows up, how do I fight back against the forces of darkness, of evil, in the name of Jesus, how do I engage in spiritual warfare? And, And what we discover is that there are some tools that we need to have to be able to fight this battle. Uh, Have you ever done a project and you didn't have the proper tools? or tried to. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I was doing a project at the house, and I very quickly realized I didn't have the proper tools to do this. And if I was going to press on in pride, uh, it was going to take several weeks, and it's probably going to look like a kindergartner did it. So I had to go get the proper tools. And here's the good news about our spiritual warfare. When we engage, God has already given us every tool that we need to have to effectively engage in spiritual warfare. But here's the problem. Many of us are trying to use tools that are not effective. So I thought about, God, what are some of the tools that we're trying to use to engage in the spiritual warfare and they're not helping us? I think the one that I probably most often use, just so you know that like I haven't like gone off the crazy train, what I tend to lean into is skepticism. You know, that's a tool that I've often tried to use of, of denial or ignoring or being skeptical and, and trying to think, well, this isn't really happening or there's another logical explanation for it. When the truth is that there is a spiritual world and when we follow Jesus, we often do come under attack and we need to recognize it. Now, some of us, we've gone to the opposite side of the extreme, and we're trying to another, use another tool that's also not effective, and that's where we're fanatical about it, or we take something and we sensationalize it. And so when we talk about spiritual warfare, like we're looking for people cl- crawling on the ceiling and their heads turning around backwards and like, you know, crazy stuff is happening. Or we take a normal, you know, just it's a spiritual encounter, but we're telling it to our friends. We're like, hey, you never like this. The darks, the lights turned out and it's like it's turned to 30 degrees. And like, we're just like sensationalizing stuff instead of saying, no, like, this is what happened and the Lord dealt with it. Or maybe another tool that some of us use sometimes that's also not effective is when spiritual attack comes to us, we don't want to deal with it, so we self-medicate. There are things happening in our life, and instead of dealing with those things and inviting the Lord into the midst of that battle, we would rather drink, or we would take a substance, or we jump online and, and we lose ourselves in social media, or we go shopping and we spend money that we don't have and get lost in these things. Just, I just don't want to think about the stuff. And so we self-medicate in some way. Or maybe for some of us, it's, it's not any of those. Maybe what we've taught ourselves to do is we compromise. And we kind of listen to the lies. And we engage in, in what those spiritual forces of darkness are trying to get us to do. Because we, it's just easier to do that than it is to fight. And God forbid there are people in the world who are actually pursuing the things of spiritual darkness and evil. They're buying into the lies and the promises. None of those tools are going to help us. They're only going to hurt us. And the good news is God has given us every tool that we could ever need to fight back. And not just fight back, but fight back effectively. So let's take a look. What does God's word have to say? What are the tools that we have? We're in Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand 
against the devil's schemes, you're going to see several things highlighted. These are the tools that God's given us, and we're going to bring those out today. So take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly realms. We talked about that last week. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. So stand firm then with what? All right, here we go. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. All right, here's where I want to start with this, guys, is we really need to start taking this seriously. When Paul gave this to the church in Ephesus, I promise you he was not trying to be cute. He was not just putting a picture together so that we could give it to children's church and they could color in the armor of God. It wasn't just a word play. This is a serious matter that is happening in the spiritual places in all of our lives. If you're following Jesus, this is happening. And if you're not following Jesus, the, the scary news is that you are completely vulnerable to all of this that is happening. And so we need to take it seriously. And, and I, we need to ask the question, where did even Paul get this from? Well, like so much of what Paul did, he actually takes it from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head, he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. Who is he? It's not a prophet. It's not a king. It's not any armor bearer or, or warrior. You know who this is? This is God himself. God looks to the broken, sinful world. He realizes we could do nothing about it. So God himself stepped into the spiritual battle for us in the world so that he could win what we can't. And this is the armor that God put on. In other words, can we realize for just a moment that all the things that Paul is telling us to do to put on the armor of God is actually God's armor? That when you stand against the evil one, you're covered by the work of God and he's offering it to you. And here's the best news is that you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from a place of victory because God's already won. Just a few verses later in verse 20, God says, and a redeemer will come to Zion, that's Jerusalem. He will come to Jerusalem to those in Jacob who turn from their transgression, declares the Lord. Who's the redeemer? The one who came to fix, who makes to set it right, to put it back the way it was supposed to be, to restore it and heal it and clean it and save it. That's Jesus, who is God in the flesh, who showed up on our behalf, that when we turn from the brokenness and the sin and the pride and the greed and the lust of our lives and the world and say, Jesus, I need you, that he brings victory. It's already there. It's certain. It's done. And we live out of that. And so when we talk about fighting against this spiritual forces of darkness and this spiritual warfare, you're not trying to win. You've already won if you stand firm and live in it. And so that's where we start. We have to stand firm, Paul says. And what we want to do is we want to commit to stand and not back down. Now, I want to give us a, a word to, to kind of remember and hold on. It'll trigger for us what we're supposed to do with each of these. And the word I want us to hold on to here is commitment. We need to make a commitment to God. A commitment that we are not going to stand or, or stop and back down. If you were a good Roman soldier in the first century and you were uh, entering into the emperor's army, you would receive what was called a post. Meaning you would be given a place where you were supposed to be and you were supposed to guard that spot. 
And when you were given that spot to guard, it was your responsibility, your primary, really your only responsibility to stand firm in that spot, to not leave, to not move. And when the battle came, you were ready to guard and to fight back. Now, here's what that means, is that soldier wasn't going looking for a fight. We are surrounded with with Christians in America who are looking for a fight. They're going to pick fights. They're out there trying to stir things up. And that is not what we're called to do. We're only called to stand firm. And so I think we need to lovingly and gently but firmly go to those brothers and sisters in Christ who are stirring things up and say, that is not what we're called to do. We speak truth, yes, but we're not going to try to beat people over the head and start fights and start arguments. We just stand firm. But here's the thing. The battle's coming. See, it's not that you're going to escape the fight. The fight is going to show up at your doorstep. The fight is going to show up at your kitchen table. The fight is going to show up in your office or at your school. And when it comes, we've got to stand firm and not compromise and not back down. Standing on what? On the word of God, on the truth. And so the next thing Paul says is we got to put on the belt of truth. If you were a soldier, this was the first thing that you would put on because it held everything else together in your armor. And so we are to filter everything and hold on to truth. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians that everything that comes our way, we need to filter it. Take all the the negative, the untrue, the harmful, the hurtful, the things not of God, the impure, and send it away, cast it out of our mind, not hang on to it. But what do we hold on to? Truth. All the things of God that bring God glory, that are from God, that honor him, that, that line up with everything that God is doing and who he is. That's what we hold on to. So in other words, we got to put forth some effort to actually pursue truth. A lot of us as Jesus followers, we would rather be passive and hope that truth finds us when what we need to be doing is pursuing truth. Explore it and find it and pray that God will reveal it to you. And every day when I open this Bible, I'm praying that God would reveal truth to me. And I say this little prayer, I've shared it with you before. God, give me eyes to see what you're doing, ears to hear what you're saying, and a heart to understand. I need truth in my life. Because we... Lord knows we live in a world of confusion. We're confused about everything. We're confused about who we are. We're confused about our relationships. We're confused about what government's supposed to look like. We're confused about what the world's supposed to look like. We're confused about who God is. We're confused about everything and we need some truth. And the the good news is there is actually absolute truth. There's a couple of reasons that I can stand here today and tell you there's absolute truth. One is just a logical reason that everything breaks down if there is no absolute truth. So when somebody says to you, there is no absolute truth, here's your response. You just ask them, is it absolutely true that there is no absolute truth? It just logically breaks down. But we also know by observation that we look around the world and we can see things to be truth. I mean, think about our founding fathers. What do they say? It is self-evident that there are some things that are true. Why? Because we observe and we see it. I mean, one of the things that I loved growing up in school was science. You know why we can study science and have a scientific method? Because there's observable truth. There's some things that, that beyond a reasonable doubt we can hold on to it. When you got in your car this morning, you had some faith that it was going to get you here based on what? Years and years of observation. All right, so we can see things to be true. We need to hold on to it. And so we're filtering everything to hold on to truth. So you, listen, we all need to, to filter out uh, the things we see on social media. We need to filter what we're seeing on the news. We need to filter what comes out of our friends' mouths. We need to filter what preachers say. We need to filter what we see on YouTube. We need to filter everything by what? By the word of God. What's true? I'm going to hold on to it. Everything else, I'm casting it out. Now, after that soldier would put on that belt of truth, the next thing that they would put on is they would put on an armored breastplate that would rest on that belt. And so we are told to put on a breastplate of righteousness. What this means for us is that we've got to plan ahead to guard against sin. 
See, when that soldier went into battle, they did not wait for the arrows to start flying and swords to be swung at them before they said, oh, I better put something on to protect myself. No, they did it before. As they're entering into battle, they already had it on. We've got a plan ahead for dealing with the sin and the brokenness and the temptation. Because if we wait until after, it's too late. And I don't know about you. Maybe some of you are, are just, you have more willpower than I do. But what happens in my life, if I wait to prepare for temptation until the moment of temptation actually hits me, rarely am I able to withstand it. And so I've taught myself to prepare ahead of time. I want to protect my heart. The center of, of love and emotion and will and connection and relationships I don't want to be wounded by all the things that are coming at me. And I don't think you do either. And so we guard ourselves with purity. We guard ourselves with obedience. We guard ourselves by trusting in what God's called us to do. Because we know God's not this angry God wanting to hold his thumb down on us. He's a loving father who wants to protect us from unnecessary self-inflicted wounds. So we, we prepare ahead of time and guard ourselves. So what we need to do here, the word we need to hold on to is we need boundaries. Put some boundaries in place to protect us. Now, once we put on that, that breastplate of righteousness, the next thing that they would strap on was their sandals. And we're told that we're to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. And what we're called to do is to remember and celebrate and share God's victories. That's what the gospel of Jesus is. It is the overwhelming, ultimate, end of the the time victory. There's nothing that's going to take this victory away or diminish it or change it in any way. It is sure, it is certain, it is done, and we live out of that victory. We remember the victories, the ultimate victory of Christ, and all the smaller victories in our lives. We celebrate that and we share it with other people. All right, so the the word I want us to hold on to here is the word framework. We need a framework for our lives that is centered on Jesus. Every decision I make, I want it to be centered on Jesus. How I evaluate my emotions, I want it to be centered on Jesus. How I relate to other people, I want it to be centered on Jesus. How I um, see the world around me and, and what I believe about the things happening, I want it to be centered on Jesus because Jesus has victory, the world doesn't. I want to live out of that. And when I can put that framework in place and I've got those shoes on, you know what happens? I can step out into this world. Scripture says be in the world, but not of the world. So I can step out and be in the world and I don't lose my peace. Because I'm not living for the things that the world has to offer. Everything can fall down around me and I still got peace because God wins. Here's the other cool thing about this. When we live with the framework of, of everything centered on Jesus, Isn't it so cool how an enemy can can become an ally with the gospel? I mean, somebody can be living in sin and brokenness and darkness, and when Jesus gets a hold of them, everything can change. This is why Jesus says, don't curse your enemies, but pray for them. How our lives might change if all the broken, hateful, mean-spirited people around us, we prayed for them and Jesus got a hold of them. How might everything be different? You see how that can bring peace, not just in our world, but in our relationships. So we want to put these these shoes on with the readiness of the gospel, that framework centered on Jesus so we can have peace. Then once we put the shoes on, the next thing is we've got to hold on to our shield, our shield of faith. And so we're called to connect with people and things that actually build faith. And the word I want us to hold on to here is the word remember. What we are remembering is the faithfulness of God. When I remember how God has been faithful, it actually builds faith in me. So what I want to do in my life, what I encourage all of us to do, is just surround ourselves with things that remind us of God's faithfulness. Put God's word up in your home. Sing worship songs in your home. Uh, Read God's word daily and hang out with people who know Jesus. I mean, should we be surprised when we hang around Upset, prideful, angry people that somehow we start to get upset, angry, and prideful? What if instead we hung out with people who build our faith? And here's where this is so very important, guys, is we need to be centered in living in a community of faith. This is why we show up week after week after week. It's not for the content. You can get really great content in a lot of different places. We show up week after week after week because we need community. 
So here's how this shield would work if you were a Roman soldier. So you'd have a, a weapon, a spear or a sword or something in your right hand, and you'd hold the shield with your left hand, and it was a big, thick wooden shield that would protect against those arrows that were getting fired at you. And I promise you, the enemy is firing arrows at you daily, whether you realize it or not. And so you'd have that shield, but holding it in your left hand and fighting with your right hand, that shield was designed in such a way that it only partly protected you. In fact, primarily, its purpose was not to protect you at all. It was to protect the person next to you. And they were designed in such a way that the Roman army fought in packs. They fought in groups. And they were protecting one another as they engaged in battle. Guys, spiritually, we need to fight in packs. We need to fight in a group. We need to fight in the body that we're protecting one another. And there's things that are going to come at you. There's going to be things that, that are going to come up against the challenge your faith. And you're going to forget the faithfulness of God. And just like me, all of us are going to have moments where we need the faithfulness of somebody else to lift us up. It's not a matter of if, but when. Now, I'm probably going to ruffle some feathers and you just need to know, I'm not angry. I'm not upset. I'm not looking for something. But I just want us to just think about something for a minute. When tragedy comes and we don't know what to do, when we have a crisis of faith and we don't know what to believe, when our kids are growing up and they're trying to decide whether or not they're going to be all in with Jesus or not, there's some things that are not going to help you. There's some things, unless faith has been integrated in it purposefully, you know, that lake house is not going to help you. That vacation is not going to help you. That travel ball is not going to help you. All those things that drag you away, the golf course on the weekend, it's not going to help you. But the body of Christ will. We've got to start taking this seriously, guys. And we've got to start committing ourselves to one another as we engage in this battle so we can build up faith. And then he says, the next thing is you've got your shield, you've got the breastplate, you've got the shoes, you've got the belt. We've got to put on the helmet of salvation. And the purpose here is to protect your mind. So much of the spiritual warfare that we engage in is happening in the mind. Why is that so? Because salvation is so intimately tied to what happens in our mind. That's why Paul says in Revelations 12, 1 and 2, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Because in the mind is, is where we find truth, what we believe, commit to, the discernment we practice. It's where the will is of what we're going to pursue in life. Uh, this is so intimately tied to will I surrender to Christ and what he's done for me or not. And so we put on this, this helmet that really is protecting the whole of us. When we put on salvation, it's protecting the whole. Because we're living based on what Jesus has done for us, not what we're trying to do for ourselves. I thank God every day that I don't get into heaven because I'm good, but because Jesus is good. And the blood of Jesus covers me when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. He said, it is finished. And I don't have to add anything to it. I can receive that grace by faith. And he's got eternity waiting for me. And so by that salvation, I'm covered. I'm good. But here's the word we need to hold on to is we need to be alert. We need to be alert. Scripture teaches us to be of sober mind and be alert. Why? Because when spiritual attack comes, if I'm not alert, if I'm not of sober mind, if I'm not clear-headed, if I haven't protected my mind from deceit and all the lies and all the things that will pull me away from God, if I don't have the helmet of salvation on to protect my mind, I will never see that spiritual warfare. I'm just going to be a sitting duck. I'm just going to be vulnerable and hit and I won't even know what hit me. And I don't want to be that way. I want to be of sober mind and alert and ready with a clear head, watching for the enemy so that I can fight back when it comes to me. And so I've got to be paying attention. So, so much of the spiritual warfare happens in our lives. If you're indwelled by the Spirit of God, then that spiritual attack is going to look like oppression. Things happening around you and, and to you. Now, if you don't have Jesus in your life, we, we can fix that today. You can surrender in faith and, and enter into relationship with him. But if you don't have the spirit of God living in you, you're vulnerable. Even to spiritual possession. 
where you're not in control of your own faculties and your own behavior. But many of us, even as Jesus followers, there's oppression coming at us every single day. So here's some things that we would look for. It might be uh, lies that are whispered to you. You know, I think about this. How many of us, whether you're married or have a good friend, you know, and you experience an unmet expectation, and on the other side of that unmet expectation, you experience a disappointment, and, and we don't really know why that expectation wasn't met, and then out of nowhere, you hear this voice in your head, and it's like, you know what, I bet they meant to do that like that. They're just trying to tick you off. You know, you, you should let them know. Like, where does that voice come from? There are so many lies. It may be a nightmare or night terrors or visions that we have. It, it might be a spirit of confusion that you're trying to read God's word and, and you're just overwhelmed with confusion and you can't find uh, truth in it and you're, you're struggling. It might be uh, feelings of depression that is not normal for you that just kind of comes out of nowhere. It might be feelings of exhaustion that you're trying to do what God has called you to do and you're overwhelmed and you're tired and you're frustrated and you're, you're exhausted by what God's called you you to do where do you think that might come from and if I'm not of sober mind and alert and paying attention what will happen if I miss it I certainly won't be fighting back worst case scenario it completely overwhelms me best case scenario I'm not living fully for what God's called me to do and so here's the thing guys again I'm not angry I'm not upset with anybody I just I want us to understand that we've got to, to get the things out of our lives that are clouding our minds. And if the only way you get through the day or you get through the weekend is you drink to the point where you can no longer think clearly, you're setting yourself up. If you're smoking that thing or, you know, whatever, and you're getting high, you're setting yourself up. If you lose yourself in social media where you no longer know who you are unless somebody else tells you or likes it or loves it or shares it, and you don't even know who you are without that affirmation, you're setting yourself up. Go back and look at the studies, guys. The, the advent of social media as it has written, risen, it exactly mirrors the rise of suicide rates. Exactly we're setting ourselves up. And so all these things that are clouding our minds, we've got to be protecting ourselves with the helmet of salvation. Who does Jesus say I am? And then once we have all that defensive armor on, then we take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So when attacked, we fight back with God's word. Because here's the thing about God's word. These 66 books inspired by the Holy Spirit, written over hundreds of years, it's not just a list of facts. It's not just a history book. It is indwelled in, in a sense. It's empowered as we're indwelled by the Spirit. It's empowered by the Spirit of God. It's a living word. It has power to it. When I think about in Revelation, when it gives us this picture of Jesus at the end, it's got a sword coming out of his mouth. And we're told that this is the sword of the Spirit. Or I think about Luke chapter 4. We talked about a couple of weeks ago when Jesus was engaging in spiritual warfare with the enemy. What did he use? God's word. And so we need to know it. We need to reflect on it. We need to pray over it. And we need to be ready to use it. All right. And, he, and here's really, if you don't get anything else, I want us to get this. Here's the word I want for us. You, you need to be armed. We're armed with the word of God. And here's what I want you to hear. There is so much fear and confusion that surrounds Spiritual warfare. It's why we get these extremes of skepticism and sensationalism and we don't live in the truth in between those polarities is because we're surrounded by fear and confusion. And we need to disarm the fear and confusion by standing on the word of God and here's how you fight back. So if you're experiencing lies, visions, nightmares, oppressive acts of depression that come out of nowhere or exhaustion or division or, or things are happening around you that just make no sense. Things are breaking apart or whatever and it's, the enemy is trying to stop you from doing what God's doing. Here's how you respond. It's very simple. You take the word of God. Armed with it, you say, you are not of God. Jesus lives in me. I rebuke you. You have no place here and move on with your day. You do not need some special ceremony or some special person with letters after their name or some special substance. You don't have to stand on your head and hold your breath for 10 seconds. 
In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. I'm moving forward. The Spirit of Jesus lives in us if we're surrendered to Him. And it's very simple. And so one of the reasons that so many people need others to help them with spiritual warfare is because they don't know that that lives in them. Either it doesn't because they haven't surrendered to Jesus or they haven't, they're not living in the victory of Christ in them and they don't know, I can confess my sin to God and be forgiven and I can rebuke this enemy. Jesus lives in me. He's greater than this enemy and I can move on with my day not fighting for victory but living out of victory. So here's my plea to us, guys. Please, please, please stop having conversations with the enemy. Stop letting them live in your head or sit at your table. Stop debating with them. Stop trying to figure out, well, I wonder if there was some truth to that. There's not. Rebuke it and move on, armed with the word of God. So when the enemy says to you, God couldn't love you from what you did, you respond, well, God's word says that there's nothing that can separate me from God's love. When the world says to you, you do you and let us tell you how to live your life and and we'll tell you who you are and what your identity is, you can respond, the word of God says that God loves me so much that I should be called a children of God and the world doesn't know who I am because the world doesn't know God. When we're over overcome by exhaustion and you're frustrated and God's called you to do something for the kingdom of God and you're like I don't think I can go anymore you quote back the scripture of God to yourself and to the enemy and you tell them this that those who wait on the Lord renew their strength in him and they soar like eagles when you face that temptation that you don't think you can overcome, you cite that scripture that says, God will never let me be tempted more than a way that I can walk out and he always gives me a way out. When you're struggling with fear, you read that word of God that says, there is no fear in the perfect love of God. It's very simple. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. You don't get to stay here. The word of God says this, and we move on. And we keep praying for each other all through it all, that we can keep doing that simple act. And so we lift up all kinds of prayers. We pray in faith, we pray in surrender, and with a big old target. We pray in faith, believing that God is able, God cares, God hears, He is present, He is active. We trust Him and we keep bringing it to Him. We pray in surrender, mirroring what Jesus said when He said, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. The end of prayer is not that I can convince God to do what I want Him to do. The the ultimate goal of prayer is that God gets a hold of me and brings me into what He's doing to unleash it in the world. That the power of God in the heavens gets unleashed in the world through our prayers. Because we're surrendered and we got to pray with a target. Guys, so too, too, too many of our prayers are so general. We pray things like, well, God, would you bless me? Like, heavenly, all sovereign God, you know, up in the heavens, w- would you take care of me and watch out for me? Here's a question. Do you, how do we even know if God answers that prayer? How do you know? So let's put a target to our prayers. Like we talked about last week, there are spiritual demonic forces in works, in our offices, in our schools, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. They're devastating. They're dividing. They're destroying. They're deceiving. Let's put a target of our prayers on them and say, Lord, I pray against the spirit of deception that I could bring truth into my office. God, I pray against the spirit of division with this family that's struggling in their marriage that would you do something specific to heal them. God, I pray against the spirit of destruction this family is dealing. They've got a terrible terrible sickness and the doctors don't know what it is, but you are the sovereign God who is the, the one and only healer. God, I pray specifically that you would heal this person. God, I pray against the spirit of discouragement. There's a friend of mine who's struggling in big financial debt and he doesn't know what to do next. Lord, you give wisdom. I pray that you would speak wisdom into him and give him a heart to receive it. Give him opportunity to work and, and do what he needs to do. Lord, I need you to specifically move in his life. We need to put a target to our prayers for each other because we're in a battle and we can do it because ultimately guys you're not trying to gain ground you're just holding on to ground that Jesus already gave you this is what it says in 1 John 
Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test these spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Can we just pause for a second? Like sometimes we read past this as if it's like a metaphor. Do you realize there were actual demonic spirits trying to confuse the church? And so Paul is telling them, you need some discernment, just like we do. Our world is full of false prophets. There's all kinds of junk from preachers on YouTube saying this and that, and it has nothing to do with the Word of God. And so we need some discernment to figure out what's going on. And he says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. It's pretty simple. So this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one, the one who's in you, all of you who are committed, following Christ, he's living in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So here's what we need to do, it's very simple. We're gonna stand in the shadow of Jesus. Just stand in his shadow. I think about the story of the little kid. He's on the playground and every week, every, every day he went to, to recess, there's a group of boys, these three boys that would bully him. They would tease him, they would pull his hair, they'd push him down. And he's like, you know, just every day, like, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? And he finally, he like musters up the courage. And so he goes to recess that day and he goes up to the bullies and he says, no more, you are not bullying me anymore. Not one more day, not one more week. I'm gonna stand up and if you're gonna beat me up, then you beat me up, but I'm not taking it anymore. And he sees like this fear well up in these bullies eyes and they're like, oh my goodness. And they, they turn around and they walk away and the boy never realized that the biggest kid on the playground was right behind him. <laughs> That's us. See, the demons, they don't care about you. They're not scared of you, but they are terrified of Jesus. I think about the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts, and they're trying to monopolize this ministry of driving out demons, and they're trying to utilize the name of Jesus. They have a relationship with him, but they're trying to use it for their own good, and they try to drive out these demons, and the demons say, hey, we know Paul, and we know Jesus, but we don't know you, and they beat them all up. See, it's not a formula. You don't just get to use it like you want, but when you are submitted to him by faith and relationship with him, he's got your back, he's there, and they're terrified. And we stand in his shadow. I don't want us as a church to go one more day living as a victim. So here's what we're gonna do, guys. Take your right hand, all right? I want you to act like you're grabbing something right here next to your head. And he said, I'm gonna take all of the messages, the, the ideas that I'm a victim to a relationship or a, a hurt or a circumstance or a situation, and I'm casting it out. I am not a victim. I live in the victory that Jesus has already won. I'm done with it. Guys, we're passionate about this because so much of what you don't see that happens behind the scenes is not on a Sunday morning. It's where we walk with people whose lives are tore up from the floor up, guys. Their lives are broken and they're hurting because they didn't realize the spiritual attack that was coming and they did not realize that they had authority to just simply say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you and continue to follow him. And they thought there was some other person that was supposed to do that for them. And I love getting to pray with you guys and we'll come to your home. And sometimes we need a body to surround each other. It does not negate the fact that when you walk with Jesus, the authority is in you. So here's where we have to start. I pray that if you're here or you're watching online and you've not made that commitment to Jesus, you will realize the vulnerable position that you are in, not just for today, but ultimately your eternity is uncertain. I know we could deal with that today and you could accept by faith the grace of God, trusting in Jesus, and he will enter you by his spirit and you will be sealed. And then once we are all doing that, once we're walking with Jesus, 
Here's what we do. We live in the victory and we're paying attention, ready to rebuke. Because here's the thing, when I put on that helmet of salvation, the enemy can't take anything from me. Nothing of value. I mean, he can discourage me and it's just gonna drive me to prayer. He can make me sick and I'm gonna wait on the healing hand of the Lord. I'm not gonna be dumb. I'm gonna go to the doctor. I'm gonna do what I need to do, but I'm gonna wait on the healing hand of the Lord. He can break stuff in my life, which he has done many, many times. I'm going to ask the Lord to provide and I'm going to work in the way that he's allowed me to do. And one day, I don't know what's going to happen. He may take my life. You know what that means? I get to be with the Lord. I get to be in heaven. Not a thing of value he can take from me unless I give it to him. We're not going to do that anymore. We're not giving anything over anymore. We're going to stand firm. We're going to love people, but we're going to love them with the truth of God, not shrinking back anymore. So like we do every week, these prayer rails are available for you if you want to come pray about anything. And we got pastors who'd love to pray with you. Just wave us over if you want us to do that. And I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know that the Lord does and he wants to meet with you. So as we sing this last song, as the worship team comes up, after I pray and say, amen, if you want to come pray, we encourage you to do that. But if you'll stand, let's pray together. Father, thank you that we have every single tool that we need to stand firm and fight when the enemy comes to our doorstep. We have the truth of your word. We pray for spiritual discernment, God. We have the breastplate of righteousness. Lord, we pray that we would be committed to you and that we would prepare ahead of time. We'd have boundaries in our lives. God, we have the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. Put the words in our mouth, Lord. Give us a biblical framework to see life. God, we've got the, the shield of faith. Help us to realize how much we need each other, to remind and remember to surround ourselves with things that build faith. God, we've got the helmet of salvation. You cover us with the blood of Christ. We are good. God, would you build up that, that trust in us that we would we'd be protected and alert to see the enemy and its schemes and its attacks. And we got the sword of the spirit. God, arm us with your truth. We don't wanna back down. We don't wanna be afraid. We don't wanna be arrogant. We want to humbly submit to you, Lord, but in courageous faith because of what you've done. So Holy Spirit, come right now. I'm asking you to fulfill a promise. You promised us that your word would not go out without accomplishing its purpose. Would you fulfill that promise right now? For those who don't know you, for those who are struggling, for those who are called into ministry, God, for those who need redemption or healing, God, for those who need wisdom or courage, would your word by the power of your spirit go out right now, minister to each and every person in the unique way that you know they need to be ministered to right now. We pray this in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.